Who's watching on YouTube and say thank you guys so much for watching online. We greatly appreciate you guys' support. Feel free to engage, feel free to share. Feel free to go in the comments box below and let us know what you're getting from this message. And there's some links down there for, uh, to better serve you. If you want to download today's worksheet, feel free to pause this video. There's a link at the bottom where you can go get your worksheet. Download today's worksheet and you will be able to follow along with the people in this room today, point by point, <clears throat> precept upon precept. Anyway, you'll be able to follow us <laughs> as we navigate what I believe God has given me for us, not just y'all, but for me as well. So feel free to pause the video, download the worksheet, um, and, and join us as we go through um, this marvelous text. And if you're listening on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud, I want to say thank you guys so much for listening. If you want this in streaming form, feel free uh, to go to any one of those platforms. You can actually listen um, to these messages. Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> we'll read, and then we'll get right into today's discussion. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility or the simplicity of their minds. They are darkening their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness due, or due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. It's crazy. <laughs> Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after likeness of God in true righteousness and wholeness. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this message. I pray, Lord, that it be God breathed, that you'll speak through me a vessel that's completely dependent on you, Father God, to, to give the people exactly what you want them to hear. And Father God, I thank you, Lord, for guiding us to this moment, to those listening and those in the room, that you've guided us to this point, not to be common with the world, but to be different, to be separate. Could be, and, and, and through that separation, impact those that still lodge within the jaws of this world system. I pray, Father, that this message is insightful, that it's, that it's full of revelation, contextualized in this text, bring in life so that we can be able to take this in our everyday lives. And Father God, I just love you and I appreciate everything you're doing in my life and these great people's lives today. And we're thankful that your presence here for if you're not here, I'm wasting their time, God, and you know I mean that. Through the thought has been given to me, I come against every principality, every demonic spirit, every witch, every warlock, every indiv individual or entity that's going to come against this moment. This moment is sacred, sanctified for the Lord's use. The Holy Spirit is governing this atmosphere and you no longer have any uh, uh, um, um, opportunity thus forward. As we go through God's word, that's going to bring life to everyone that hears. We silence you, but Father, we thank you, ultimately, for your guidance. You know we do pray? Amen. Amen. So we're going to be talking about how different are you? How different? We've been in Ephesians 4 for the last four or five weeks, and now we're in the text of the new life that's supposed to be birthed out of healthy communities. Um, but, but today we're going to be talking about how different we are from the world. Today's hashtag... It's I'm different. I'm <clears throat> different. Let's look at the problem. From God's vantage point, he can barely see a difference in some of us. Many of us think that we are on fire for God, but are lukewarm. From God's vantage point, the highest point of everything created, he can barely see a difference in some of us. Many of us think that we are on fire for God, but are really lukewarm. It's crazy how many of us trust our carnal viewpoint, our vantage point, and rarely consult God to see how different we are from the world. Now, the crazy thing is, it's not necessarily we talk about a difference from the world per se for some of us. Some of us are not different from the carnal Christianity that's in our culture today. And God is asking us, to examine our hearts, to see how different we really are, and to see how dependent we are, and then through those two entities, we'll be able to fulfill the purpose in our lives. Let's get the cause. <clears throat> the cause is threefold. The reason why people cannot see a difference in themselves, or they think they're on fire for God, but they're really lukewarm, is due to the fear of being different, the lack of discipleship, and the lack of deep deliverance. The cause of this problem is threefold. The fear of being different, 
the lack of discipleship and the lack of deep deliverance. <laughs> it's crazy, man. I think KB said something on his verse this past week. He was like, you know, um, my favorite playlist is I hope heaven. I hope that's my favorite placement. He says, I, I want to be on heaven's playlist. That's that's the best placement. And and many people get so consumed with with this 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 realm that that they think they're on fire for God because modern day Christianity has allowed itself to be so carnal and so in, in a compromised state that many of us can't tell the difference between being a real God-focused believer versus a, a, a Christian carnal culture believer. And the reason why many of us are not endeavoring to be different or the reason why many of us think but do not know about the state of the flame that's in us is because number one, we are afraid to really be different. A lot of people are afraid to be different because of what they may lose in being different. That even if I'm different <clears throat> from modern day Christianity's flow, or if I'm different from the compromises and the carnality in the world, I may lose friends, I may lose family, I may lose funds, I may lose a lot of things. But a loss with God is not a loss. Anything you lose for Christ's sake is actually a gain. When we understand that, we'll say, God, I'm not trying to be different to say I'm different. I'm just going to follow you, and if there's a difference made, then I know whatever I lose by following you, I really didn't lose. Anything that you lose on behalf of God really wasn't with you, really wasn't for you. God is not even concerned about followers per se. He cares about faithfulness. Jesus demonstrated that in, our, in his earthly existence when he even told his disciples and the people, he even forced them, gave them the opportunity to leave because he says, I'm about my father's business. He never entangled himself in what Peter said. He never entangled himself in what anyone else did around him because he knew his ultimate objective was to fulfill the purpose that the father gave him. And our, our agenda should be, Father, whatever you need for me to do, whether if I got to do it alone, I'm going to be different for you. Some people are just the fear of being different, the fear of being alone, the fear of being ridiculed, mocked. Listen, man, I want to join him in this suffering. I want to join him because I know that the suffering and the ridicule and the persecution is proof that what I'm following is real. If what I was following wasn't real, there would be no need to be persecuted for. But because I am the light and darkness is afraid or allergic to light, they're going to always try to stifle your light. How different do you want to be? How uniquely do you want to be as you pursue your destiny? The second, the lack of discipleship. <clears throat> Some people are not making a difference or they're not different themselves because they're not being discipled he didn't say go make fans of the world he didn't say go make followers of the world he didn't say go make a brand for the world he said go and make disciples it's crazy that, that discipleship is a lost art that nobody wants to really get into the nitty-gritty the dirty of people's lives to see true salvation in every corridor discipleship is dirty business because not everybody wants accountability. Not everybody wants people in their business. But, but, but we got to make it our aim as we grow into maturity to endeavor to say, God, am I being sent to make disciples of all nations? Because the cure of this sinful disease is discipleship, helping people better understand the hope that they believe in. If that's not your goal, I'm not sitting there saying you're going to be making 45 and 68 disciples. What I'm saying is, are you even a disciple? Disciple in his root word is a person who's disciplined, spiritually disciplined, <clears throat> saying, God, I'm a discipline this flesh. I'm a discipline this mind. I'm going to be a disciple of yours, which means that in, if I endeavor to follow you, I have to be OK with dying first. <laughs> that, that's, that's a big that's a big ask. You know, God, Jesus talking about, hey, yo. You desire to follow me. That's cool, man. Cool. Um, but I'm going to slide this contract over. <laughs> I need you to die now. Now. If you want to follow me, you got to die first. And you got to be willing to carry this heavy cross, this burden for, for lost souls. You got to, like, like if, that's, if you're not willing to die to yourself and you're not willing to die to others by carrying your cross, then you are not fit to follow. 
How can we teach other people to follow when we don't even know which Jesus we're following? <laughs> there's the real Jesus and there's many fakes. We got to get to a place where we say, God, wherever you lead me, even if, even if I'm different from everyone, I'm going to follow you. Number three, another cause, the lack of deep deliverance. <clears throat> Shallow deliverances saves no one. This Christianity has a shallowness to it. Let's deal with the surface sins. Let's deal with the surface issues. Let's not deal with the deep, the dark, the deadly. Let's not deal with the unforgiveness. Let's not deal with the resentment. Let's not deal with the bitterness. But in order for me to be different, I got to wash out all the things in my heart that's caused me not to follow him fully. My question to you is, what have you yet to be delivered from? If we truly want to be different, and if we truly want to make a difference, we got to say, God, deliver me. From God's vantage point, he can barely see a difference in some of us. Many of us think that we are on fire for God, but are really lukewarm. It's going to be crazy when we stand before God and God looks at us and say, I can barely see a difference. You was just like them. You listened to what they listened to. You, you, you followed how they walked. You, you really wasn't on fire for me. And that's a question I have to ask myself. Has someone stifled my flame? Am I really lukewarm thinking I'm hot? <clears throat> thinking I'm on fire? Thinking I'm doing, do you know there's so many people doing ministry on behalf of God, but their ministry is a lukewarm, a, a odor to God that is distasteful, that he spits it out of his mouth, that he doesn't even attend their church services, that he is not even in their midst, that people who do great work in the community, philanthropists, they're not even a, a kingdom citizen. And we got to ask ourselves, God, before you use me, make sure that I'm useful. Being useful means everything in me that I have yet to deal with, I have to bring before the altar of God and say, God, I need this to end now. Because this problem is the fear of being different, I'm afraid I may lose something, the lack of discipleship, I don't want nobody really in my deep business, and a lack of deep deliverance, being set free from what's in the basement. Look at the next point. <clears throat> For us to truly make a difference, we must be different. In order for us to make a difference, we must be different. Our difference makes up the difference. For us to truly make a difference in this world, to truly make a difference in our communities, to truly make a, a difference in our, in our family, in our friends' lives, in our specific areas of influence, we must be different. You cannot be like the world and change the world. You can't be like the world and impact the world. You cannot mix in carnality and expect sanctification to be in somebody's life. There has to be a difference. There has to be a distinction. There has to be a separation. And yes, it may not be financially wise. And yes, it may not get you things immediately. But what are we really after? Are we after the glory of God or our own? Are we after the glory of God or the people that we can have and make as friends? We got to make a distinction. We got to say, God, for you I live, for you I die. God, I'm going to join you in your suffering. I'm going to follow you even if I have to be at it alone because I know for a fact that me being different can make up the difference in somebody else being different. That if I stay consistent in being different, if I stay consistent in being faithful, my faithfulness will inspire the faithlessness and bring faithfulness in a person that is lacking faith. That's why we got to say, God, what am I lacking in my life that can lead to the lacking in someone else's life? Me being different can make up the difference in my brother's life, can make up the difference in my sister's life, can make up the difference in my family, can make up the difference in any person that I dare to say I love. <clears throat> you know, what's worse or what's important? Being different for 20 years to have that one moment to save someone or to sacrifice being different and be like someone and never reach them. I'm a living witness on the beauty of staying different and seeing the same people that ridiculed, that talked about me, that didn't like me, 
five, seven years later, it's reached because of my consistency. I'm telling you, if you remain different, you will help bridge the gap of those who endeavor to be different themselves. For us to truly make a difference, we must be different. We cannot be like the world and expect the world to be like us. I'm not sitting there saying that we can't go in the mix and, and be a light. We, well, there's a difference between being a light and being like. <clears throat> light and darkness are not the same. Some of us, we dim our lights to be like darkness so that darkness can feel comfortable. You know, I never feel uncomfortable in dim lights. Dim lights make you sleepy. So what happens is when a Christian dims their light, they increase the sleepiness in the people that they're trying to reach. People, when they're bright and they're light and they're shining, people who want to be changed will draw close and the people who don't want to be changed will be drawn away. And that's okay. I got to be okay with just being a light. <laughs> I say this often. <laughs> These lights are not having a conversation, but they're communicating. They're showing us us. These lights are not saying, hey, look at me, I'm a light. <clears throat> look at me, look how bright I am. The light's just saying, I'm just a light. That your greatest witness is just being a light, but don't telling people what kind of light you are. All you gotta do is say, you know what? By me being connected to the source, I will be revived. And then as I shine throughout my life, people who truly want Christ will be drawn to me. If you wanna change the world, you must be different from it. Next point. <clears throat> we can't save a world that we are no different from. It seems like the marketing strategies of today's believer is that if I just add a little sprinkle of commonality, if I add a sprinkle of the world, then that's how I reach them. I've learned in my life that people, idolatry is so deep rooted that you can compromise all day, but your compromise can't change their life. So many people stoop down to try to bring people up to be like them versus saying, you know what? Come see me when you're ready to be changed. We can't save a world that we are no different from. It's okay to be different. My question, for the night is which kingdom do you have more in common with? Which kingdom do you have more in common with? If you look at your life, if you analyze your day-to-day -day interactions, do you look more, of a, more as a kingdom citizen or this earth citizen? You gotta look at your life and say, which kingdom do I have more in common with? Am I more like God, am I more like him, or am I, am, or am I more like the world? Am I more like my father, God, or am I of the, my father, the devil? Let's keep going. I have a lot of notes here. Y'all all right? Next point. Right now, you are either living a conforming life or a transforming life. Right now, you are either living a conforming life or a transforming life, meaning you're going in one or two different directions. Neither are stagnant. Nobody is truly conformed. Nobody yet is truly transformed. Death stops that. There's always room to conform. There's always going to be room to transform. We just got to ask ourselves, which direction am I going? Right now, you are either living a conforming life, conforming into the image of this world, or a transforming life being converted to the image of Jesus. Neither are stagnant. There is always room to conform and transform. It all boils down to the maturity of our minds. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice that I'm presenting before God, the, uh, death and life, <laughs> that I'm presenting uh, as, as, as unto God, that, that I'm killing my old self daily and I'm allowing the new of me to live. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is, the Bible says, your reasonable <laughs> service. That because of what I did, this is what you should reasonably do. If we really talk in business here, if we really talk in numbers here, this should be your reasonable service. It continues to read, be not conformed 
to this world, we know this, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. The state of your mind will determine the, the state of your life. If your mind is conforming, your life is gonna conform to the image that your mind is influenced by. Either you're transformed or conforming. You gotta ask yourself, how mature am I mentally? Am I conforming to this world? Or, if I'm or am I transforming into the image of Jesus? It is your choice. I just don't think many of us have been convinced. It's crazy. We hold on to things that we should let go. And the things that we're holding on that's contrary to God is diluting our impact. Next point. God wants us to have a different. <laughs> got some H's for you. God wants us to have a different hope. A different heart. A different happiness. God wants us to have a different hope, heart, happiness, hustle, help, and habits. God wants us to have a different hope, a different heart, a different happiness, a different hustle or grind, a different help, and habits. None are possible without holiness. Holiness is not a sexy topic. The Bible says without it, no man. <laughs> Woo! I can start right there and we can go and, and cry our sins out right now. He says without holiness, no man, <clears throat> no person shall see God. Holiness. We're supposed to have a different hope than the world. A different trust. Have you ever noticed while you was walking with God, God always finds you in places of dependency? <laughs> Life was good before you got saved with God. You had, a, you had a lot of money. Everything was there. And God says, every now and then I put you in phases to make you or wake you into realizing you need to be dependent on me. Lost that job. Lost the car. God says, I have to build your faith in darkness so that you can stand in faith in the light. I got I to gotta strip some things in your private life so that your hope will continuously be in me. We're not supposed to have the hope of the world because hope deferred makes the heart sick. The devil's hope is always deferred because if it's continuously deferred, you will continue to have a sick heart. That when he says, hey, this person will give you everything you ever thought. This job will give you everything you thought. It, it always is always trying to match or connect to your idolatry, knowing that that thing cannot truly satisfy you. Our hope cannot be in anything else but God. And God will always, for new believers, to seasoned believers, test where your hope is in, test where your trust is in. And we as a people of God must have a different hope that we should build our faith in good times so that when things are, are, are subsiding, we can still keep our anchor in him. So many people are going to lose hope because their hope was never anchored in God. We will really see what your hope is really in when your area of hope is tested. As a believer, I got to I got to anchor my hope in the hope that's above all hopes. I got to anchor myself in a hope that will not lose its foundation because I promise you it's going to get ugly. And people are going to be in awe of the believers because the believers are going to be walking out like the children of Israel with the Egyptian gold. That we're going to be the ones looking sustained, looking kept, looking preserved. But how can you? preserve the world if you're not salt yourself we got to say God my hope is in you that my anchor is not in this world's financial system is not in this world's way of living my hope is different my hope is in the rock that cannot be moved God wants us to have a different heart not a heart of stone but a heart a flesh, a heart that is gentle, kind, uh, 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 discerning, 
He wants us to have a different heart. That he says, love your enemies. He says, he says, do all you can to be kind. That we're supposed to not be as evil and cut in corners or harboring bitterness like the world does. In God, when we holy and set apart for his use, he will turn that heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Then that we're, when it's time to be used by him, we'll have the right heart. God is looking for people that when pressed will still do the right thing. Your heart is a reflection of your habits. He doesn't want us to have the heart of the world that's hardened. He wants a heart that's softened and protected by a mind that's being renewed. God wants us to have a different happiness. He wants to have a different happiness. God's form of happiness is joy. The world's form of happiness is conditional happiness. That I'm only happy if these conditions are right. It's crazy how many believers, they're on fire for God, they're happy with God when everything is good. But they lack joy. They lack contentment. They lack understanding and knowing that God is with them. We're all guilty of worry. But the more we worship God, that worry should subside. Because yes, we're human. Yes, things are gonna rock you. But you gotta make sure that your joy is anchored in the rock so that when you have been shaken after the earthquake has settled, you will see you're still standing. But when we get so caught up in conditional happiness, we're only happy when we have somebody. You know how many people missed out on their assi assignments whilst they were single because they were not content in their singleness? How many people missed out on their productivity? <laughs> it's crazy. People think that when they get married that they're going to have time to get stuff done. <laughs> when they have kids, they think they're going to they, they they're gonna get stuff done. Like people think, oh, you know, and they waste their singleness, waste their time. And God's like, yo, bro, like, I want to get you married, but like, when you get married, you're going to be sexing all the time. You're going to be, y'all going to be, because even Paul said when you marry, y'all consume with each other's concerns. But when you're single, you're completely devoted to God. Your single is supposed to be devoted to God so that you can produce things that can potentially sustain your marriage and bring a peace there. Versus, man, I wish I would have got that done. Now I'm problematic. Listen, are you being prepared to be a man of peace or a man bringing problems? A woman of peace or a woman bringing problems? It all boils down to your contentment. God wants us to have a different hustle. These people talking about, I don't sleep. I grind. What's sleep? Sleep when I'm dead. I hustle. I get mine. I used to be that same guy. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm in it. Gucci bags under my eyes. Tied. <laughs> Thyroid acting up. Bodies acting up because it's shot. Because I'm hustling hard. Hustle. Hustle. And I'm actually hustling out here and doing things like I'm supposed to go get it. And God's like, boy, go to sleep. Rest. Because when a person understands that, yo, I can hustle and go get it, but in God's life with him, things is timing. <laughs> Man, I, I was so burnt out because I hustled, yo. <laughs> I was hustling and I got to the end of my hustle and God's like, it's not time though. <laughs> you wasted all the energy. You done told the world ideas you shouldn't have said nothing about. You're tired. And you two years off my timing. We're supposed to be hustling in a pace. Not out there going to go get it. Because they got to get, they have to take drugs to keep it. <laughs> they're in the booth. They're in, they're in the basketball court. You know, you know, we know some people right now. I'm not saying he's doing PEDs, but we got people out there taking drugs, doing things to keep this level. I don't want to get to my end of my life with an asterisk like a Barry Bonds. I want to make sure that everything I did was done clean, paced, healthy, so that when I'm 60 and 70 years old, I'm not broken down because I idolized what I was hustling for. Oh, we, we men, we can idolize, and women, idolize our purpose. Idolize what we're hustling for. We're supposed to be different. Because God said, man, I give you seasons and I give you a timing. So many of us are so consumed with the moment of transition that we're not ready for the moment after the transition. Everything in life is season, season, 
timing, season, timing, season, timing. God always gives you a season before your timing of promotion for your moment of preparation. Many of us, we just like, I want my timing now, so you hustle to go get it, and in your free will, you can go get it and have it, but you won't be mature enough to sustain it. So many people have a lot of money in their account, nice cars, big homes, hollow hearts, tired, cut corners to get it. They got it, but they didn't get it the right way. We're supposed to be or to have a different help. We're not supposed to just help people that we can benefit from. We're supposed to help those that can't help themselves or cannot help us. So many of us, we only do for the people above us, but never reach a hand for those beneath us. Our help is supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be consuming and being hoarders and helping ourselves. We're supposed to be people of God that's concerned about the poor. He talks about how did, how did we overlook you, Jesus? How we did not, how we was not faithful to you, he says, because you didn't see the hungry, the naked. You didn't clothe them. You didn't take care of me because you didn't take care of them. Our help is supposed to be different. All of our uh, pursuits should not be about having a million followers followers or selling selling millions of albums or millions of books or having our name in life it should be our ultimate focus is to be distribution channels for those who cannot help themselves what, what are you really helping yourself to help we got to get to a place where we say you know what God give me a burden for a group of people sometimes we can go through life and the only burden we have is the burden of being successful we don't have a burden for the people that may not ever be successful the way we think success is. He wants us to have different habits. Private habits, public habits. He doesn't want us to be consumed in fitness and, 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 and consumed with money and consumed with all these different things. He wants us to have habits that's balanced to ensure that we fulfill our purpose. Some of us are practicing things right now that's keeping us from productivity, keeping us from producing. Right now, man, I'm going to go get it. My goal is to do it in a balanced way. That's why that hustle point was for me. That sometimes I can hustle and get things and, and endeavor to get things done, but sometimes I forget that these hustling habits can be my detriment. That we got to get to a place where we practice things to ensure our bodies whole, our mind. Man, I'm looking on Google, all, I'm looking up health benefits of turmeric. Looking up health benefits to curry. I'm looking at health benefits to everything. I'm making drink concoctions because I'm making sure that I'm making sure my liver is going to be functioning well. Because I need my liver. I need my spleen. I need my thyroid. I need all my lymph nodes. I need my kidneys. I need everything. Therefore, I got to make sure I tend to the greatest gift that I have besides the Holy Ghost, and that's my body. If you don't take care of the temple, the temple will break down. And many of us do not take care of the temple. And that's all you got. Once you die, your purpose that's left in you stops. I want to be like Paul and say, I fought the fight, kept the faith. I finished the course. God, take me when you need to take me because I'm finished. Jesus did not leave here until he said it is finished. If you do not have fellowship with the Father, you won't know what you're supposed to finish. You won't know when to utter those words. It <laughs> is finished. I don't want to go to God <laughs> and he says halfway done. I want to hear those glorious words, son. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Was, I perf was you perfect? No. But did you finish? Yes. What are you really trying to do down here? The Bible talks about no soldier entangles themselves with civilian affairs. For their hope and joy is in the one that enlisted them. Right now, everyone's saved in here. Everybody know Jesus. We can get you saved. We can get you. I, I know the plug. I can get you. I can get you there. Everybody saved, right? Cool. That means you're enlisted. <laughs> soldier. Welcome. I got the Holy Ghost for you. It's my voice in you. This word right here is your directions. This right here 
is your armor. It's crazy we walk out the house with no helmet of salvation. We don't know why our minds aren't even renewed on how saved we are. We don't have no breastplate of rights. Our heart is full of unrighteousness versus being righteous. Our shoes are shod with the preparation of problems and not the preparation of peace. Where our clothes is unaltered, it's not, ang it's not tailored right, it's not held up together because we the, we got the belt of falsehood, not the belt of truth. That many of us cannot quench no fiery darts because we're too weak to hold up the shield of faith. That many of us are not doing what we need to do with the sword of the spirit. Therefore, when we're tempted by the devil, we don't know how to fight. We start using words and what the preacher said versus what the word of God said. The devil don't care about what they wrote, what they preach, what they said. He cares about what is written. If you're not fully armed, when you walk out that house, you will get lit up. And the enemy saying, I don't care how big you talk, there's nothing covering your heart. There's nothing covering your mind. There's nothing covering your feet. You need your shoes shod with the preparation of peace because a soft answer can turn away wrath. You got to bring peace wherever you go. And if we're not able to understand what all the armor is for, we'll always be vulnerable. But none of this is possible. You won't have a different hope can't get a different heart you won't get a different happiness hustle helper habits without being holy holiness is not perfection it's just saying I'm only used by one person <laughs> everything in my house until I'm married <laughs> it's set apart for me <laughs> it is holy <laughs> I, de I deem <laughs> this 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 home holy It's set apart for holy use some of us, we're more in the enemy's hands than we're in God's hands. I have an acronym for tools, tangible objects operating, T-O-O, -O, tangible, op tan tangible objects operating for lost souls. Forget the F, <laughs> little, little, little F. don't worry about that. Tools, where are supposed to be objects operating for the saving of lost souls, period. Either you're helping souls remain lost or you hate helping them to be found. But if you're not set apart for God's use, if you're not holy, man, like if you're not willing to be in his presence, be separate, you won't have a difference in any of these areas. Let's break some scripture down. 15 minutes and I'll be out your way. Ephesians, let me read it again. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility or the simplicity of their minds. They are darkening their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to greed, man, greedy. That means they're hunting to practice every evil kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's go to the point one in the scripture breakdown. The first verse, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Look at the first point. You must no longer walk like those outside of covenant. You must no longer walk like those outside of a covenant. You are either walking in covenant or in compromise. We as believers, we are connected to a covenant that is so distinct that everyone should be asking to be a part of that covenant. Paul was like, yo, man, I testify that you must no longer. He was like, yo, these people, the Corinthians, this, oh, the, the people in Ephesus, sorry, <laughs> were people that compromised. A lot of idols was in town. The, the, the whole lukewarm idea came from the church of Ephesus or the, or the F, uh, Ephesus uh, town because of the water transport that when the water was being transported from a cool area, by the time it got to Ephesus, it was lukewarm. That's why this text is, is implying that he was trying to say people of Ephesus, don't be or act like the people that you've been saved from. You're in a covenant. In that covenant comes life. In that covenant, there's ability. In that covenant, is you, it's the cheat code. 
that you're supposed to move differently, think differently, navigate differently. You must no longer walk like the Gentiles, the people who are outside of covenant, even if their walk outside of covenant is beneficial, at the end it will bring forth death. How many of us are acting more like Gentiles than believers? How many of us are more in compromise than operating the covenant that has been given us by Christ? He was, man, I'm imploring you, man, man, why y'all walking like them? Can somebody in America stand on a post and say, why are y'all walking like them, talking like them, acting like them? Because that ain't going to reach them. And so many of us are walking more like these other entities versus walking in our covenant. Number two. It continues to read, in the futility of their minds. Now, this I say and testify to the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds or the simplicity of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Verse 19, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. This verse shows us the effects slash process of not being in covenant with God. Those that are outside of God are number one, simple minded. <clears throat> simple minded. <laughs> but even if you do, who was, who was the atheist that just died? And, and I always tell people, people was asking me, there was a kid who loves that atheist, and I was just kind of trying to keep my composure. But I, one thing I told her, I said, everyone dead knows the truth. <laughs> It's crazy. Everyone that dies, even if they lie through their life, have to bow that knee to the truth. It's crazy to be wise in man's eyes, but to be dumb in the eyes of God. I don't puff myself up in my wisdom. I puff myself up or I am not puffed up, but I am I am held up by what I know about God simple-minded people was asking me do, do you and your girlfriend stay together nah <laughs> to them that seems beneath <laughs> that seems like well how do you how are you gonna know if you like it if you I said look bro <laughs> God formed us together <laughs> What God puts together, nothing can put asunder. He knows what I need, knows what she needs. I don't, because there's a God element. People don't want God in their relationship because if God is in relationship, sin must stop. But that's, that's, that's simple to them, but that's simple to me. That's dumb to me. But it's crazy how many of us as believers are thinking so simple in our carnality, but it's really dumb when you know it within context of the word of God. That's when I see young people doing what they do. Young people gonna do what they do. My bad, I'm, <laughs> I'm 32. But what I'm saying is, they gonna do what they wanna do. I look at them, I listen to them, and I, I let the babies do what they do. I let them live, because I say, you know what? I was foolish when I was their age. <laughs> Five years ago. <laughs> I was like, but I realized this wave of compromise got people thinking and talking smart. And when, when, I, when it's 2009, when I got into the whole reformed kind of stuff, and I, you know, I went from listening to a lot of these preachers over here to uh, getting into apologetics, and I started getting around people. You know, I think even the truth said in one of his songs that this audience has taught me how to live, but this audience taught me how to think, but nobody's really trying to help us do both, right? And as I was navigating, man, because I come from those circles where over emotionalized, but 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 you but you 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 heard holiness, even though nobody was practicing it. <laughs> but you you heard about it, you knew about it, <clears throat> and these people talked so smart, and I was intrigued, like wow, like this must be the real place of the gospel, right? No, not to any culture. But what I'm trying to make a point is that when I began to see how these smart talking believers were living. I was like, y'all just mind heavy and hollow in your heart and there's no balance. It doesn't matter if you know everything about God, his attributes, the atonement, the imputation of righteousness, but you don't know him. You can know all about God, but if you don't know him, you simple minded. A wise person is a person who fears God 
And Martha, oh sweet Martha, was cooking dinner, feeding the people. Got mad when she saw Mary at Jesus' feet because culturally, as a woman, back in the Bible day, culturally, women weren't even supposed to be with the man talking doctrine. They weren't even supposed to be there. Culturally, the women were supposed to be, and people talk about the Bible is, a, is an anti-woman book. Nah, it's very female friendly. <laughs> if you really see how Jesus moved, that he moved counterculturally, that, that, that while Martha was doing what the culture said was so, that she was supposed to do, she missed out on the opportunity to be in the new covenant at Jesus' feet because what she was doing was beneath her but look where, who she was beneath. Many people get so caught up on doing what the culture says is the right thing. But that's really dumb compared to what God wants us to do. Point two, mentally darkened. Simple-minded practices leads to mental darkness. Mentally blind, ignorant. Number three, this text shows us that they drifted from God and his abundant life due to a hardened, callous heart. They drifted from God and his abundant life. We're not talking about abundant life financially alone or abundant life and a prosperous life externally. We're talking about both, internally and externally, that, that, I, that I'm prosperous first on the inside. That Wow, I didn't know life could be so great with all this joy in my life and all this love in my life and all this kindness in my life. That's an abundant life that I have so much love, kindness, gentleness, meekness, uh, and all the fruits of the Spirit that when I'm navigating through life, it flows out. That's the abundant life that I have so much in me that that in me gets me the things externally. But these people, they are darkening their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance in them due to their hardness of heart. How many people have drifted from God following simple philosophies that are carnal? Number four, the Bible says that they have given themselves over to sensual practices. The effects of not being consistent in the covenant of God leads you to have a simple mind, which then darkens your mind, then drifts you from God and you living a life that's not abundant, but your heart becomes hard towards God. And then when your heart has become hardened towards God, you'll start giving yourself over to things that defiles you. Number three, let's keep going. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Many believers fall into these traps in certain areas of their lives due to them not hearing about the real Jesus and not being discipled in his principles. Many people fall into these traps because Paul was like, but that like as if someone was teaching a different philosophy. As if people was like, well, it's okay to listen to this and be a Christian too. It's okay to do this and be a Christian. It's okay, it's okay. As if they was taught in that. But Paul was like, but that is not the way you learn Christ. But he was like, oh, my bad. Let me, let me digress. digress. Assuming that you have learned about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. The truth is not in anyone else <clears throat> but Jesus. And many believers fall into these traps in certain areas of their lives, privately or publicly, due to them not hearing about the real Jesus and not being discipled in his principles. Three scriptures real quick, and I love them. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you know if those are the, two, the only two things you know, you're probably wise, wiser than anyone else in this world? If you consume your life with him as a person, and the miracle of his crucifixion. You are wiser than people from Harvard, people from any of those Ivy Leagues, any person that's got a dense education, because when you know him, you can have a poor grammar, bad vocabulary, but the annoyance on your life. <laughs> Get your vocabulary right. Don't, I'm not saying to say you don't work on that, but so many people focus on their degrees, focus on their accolades, focus on who they know. So they replace the name Jesus and get more consumed with other people, other philosophies, other people, what they said a hundred years ago, get so caught up in that, but they don't know Jesus, him and him crucified. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection 
and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Boy, nobody want to talk that talk. What you mean, Josh? You're talking about that I may know him and the power? Like, like, like knowing him means I know him and I actually get a chance to get to know the power that actually resurrected him? That the same power that raised, like, like sometimes people don't read that. They read it and it sounds good at the end of a sermon. No, 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 no. I, inside of me, got the same power that raised a dead man and we don't tap into that power. Imagine where our world would be today if all we cared about was him and trained ourselves in stewarding the power that resurrected him and being okay with and may and the Bible reads and may share like like I, I, I want to share in this suffering because if I share in this suffering that means this thing is valid <laughs> when people be persecuting Christians that's why I tell people don't debate people who are atheists sometimes when I watch their videos and how they debate they're debating from resentment hatred egotisticality <laughs> made it up <laughs> they're, they're, they're coming as if they're trying to use their wit they're trying to use their their education to diminish this simple created process but they look to me they look stupid come on you going all out your way and in my eyes you look more insecure that's why when it comes to me, when people be coming at me, I don't care if they see me comment on somebody else's post after them. I don't entertain people that's trying to engage. Listen, I don't got to fight education with education because you may know more than me. All I know is the hope that's in me. And when you know Jesus in the power, like imagine if we really tap into our power, like some Power Ranger stuff, like some like some like some Dragon Ball Z, man, like. Like, 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 like some, like some, them, them car, like for real, for real. Like if we tapped in, I don't need your turtle stuff because they ain't really had no powers. But what I'm saying is if we really got into our superpower, like if we, like some of us could have, that's why I love the gift of the spirit. Like some of us don't even know, not the gift, yeah, uh, they don't know, they don't know what their gifting is. They don't even know their superpower. Imagine you had superpower but didn't know it. The movies have been telling us that amongst us, amongst the people, there are a certain few who have powers that they know not of. And when they ascend together, and then the marvels, right? And so all this different stuff, they got all these powers, but don't know. But all of us got power. <laughs> well, it's been a long day. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Go therefore. Jesus, this is, this is the Lord talking here. It's red. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Man, that's, imagine if we did that. Okay, God, what nation you want me to make disciples in? What part of culture do you want me to make disciples in? And God, I'm going to do that with all of my heart. And then we'll find the nearest tub or water, and I'll baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He didn't say, you got to go to seminary first. It doesn't say you got to have a certain type of education. It doesn't say anything like that. Now, should you be wise and understanding? Don't, I'm not, I'm not, what I mean by that, you don't have to go through these great lengths to operate what the Bible wants you to operate. Should you be solid in your understanding? Yes. Should you be disciplined in your apologetics to a degree? Yes. Should you be in a place where you have some maturity to help people lead? Yes. But what he's saying says, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them teaching them and he says i'll be with you if you do that either way he's gonna be with us but man imagine god being with us if we truly say i'm going to educate myself only on him and my power imagine if we say you know what god i'm gonna work on my superpower i'm not gonna envy nobody else's power i'm gonna harness my gifting and I'm gonna make sure that power is anointed so that when I use it, it'll be effective. Number four, <clears throat> the Bible continues to read, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and wholeness. First point, 
It is our responsibility now after hearing the truth, I think I messed it up in my sentence, to put off our old self and assess slash route out anything that is hindering us from doing so. It's our responsibility when we hear truth to put off our old self and rid anything in us that's hindering us. The Bible didn't say, I'll put on the whole armor of God or I'll put off your old self. He's saying, all I'm supposed to do is to present you the truth and whatever sparks in your heart will lure you into following it. But every day you have to be cognizant of, am I putting off my old self and putting on my new self? What am I doing? You don't gotta wait until you're pressed to figure out what you are wearing. <laughs> People don't work and they know they easily offended. They know they got anger issues, but they don't work on it. And they wonder why they're killing their testimony and, and, and defaming the name that they say they follow. But we're not doing what we're supposed to do every day to ensure that we put it off. Next point. Our old self was corrupted by deceitful desires and our new self is continued by divine desires. It all boils down again to the state of our minds. The Bible talks about to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life. Like that was, like that ain't even supposed to be alive for real, for real. And it's corrupt through deceitful desires. Our old self was corrupted because we desire things deceitfully, but our new self is sustained by our divine desires. Last point, our new self is hungry for God's true righteousness and wholeness, not the GMO version. Your spirit that's being regenerated by Jesus, spirit, is really hungry for God's true righteousness and wholeness. The Bible reads, verse 24, and to put on the new self, created after like that means your new self has already got an image that it's supposed to be looking towards after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness meaning when you read a text like that in true righteousness and holiness then could that imply there's a false righteousness and holiness that means we got to be stewards and say there may be a false righteousness out there and there may, there may be a false holiness out there but your new self is really hungry after God's true righteousness and holdings, not a GMO version. Right now, there's a genetically modified version of righteousness, holiness, and the way the world moves. If you take care of your daily practice of removing your old self, you will be able to see the difference between the true and the fakes out there. My final thoughts. Y'all learning something? Number one, your days reflect which one you give life. Your old self or your new self. Your days reflects which one you give life. <clears throat> You're either feeding one or starving the other. But you can't feed both and expect to be faithful to God. Your homework for this week, if you choose to do it. <laughs> Blue pill, red pill, if you choose. Am I different and am I truly making a difference? This week I want you to think through your level of holiness slash difference. I want you to assess the areas you are not set apart in and the areas you are and process how they are affecting your hope, heart, happiness, hustle, help, and habits. Once you finish, if you choose to start, I want you to, I want you to on the bottom or the back of this paper or on your computer, whatever you like to do, Develop a set-apart plan against the areas you are not set apart in. I pray this is a blessing. So look at the box. First two boxes. And for those watching online, you can actually download this worksheet and get this exercise. And what areas are you not set apart or different from the world? That's a small box, but I had to make it fit. You can get another sheet of paper and write down the areas where you lack holiness or being set apart. The areas that God can't use because it's currently being used by the enemy. Next box, what areas are you set apart from the world? Think positively. Think, well, okay, I'm set apart in this area, right? 
Next row, and how are they affecting your hope? You can listen to this message again and find out what I said about hope. Your heart, your happiness, your hustle, your help, and your habits. And the last box, I want you to develop an anti-compromise, set-apart plan. <laughs> and I want you to really be active and intentional about saying, God, I only want to know you and the power of your resurrection. Because, Father, if I know those two, I will be truly wise. Father God, I thank you for this mess. I pray it's a blessing. I pray, Father God, as we navigate, that we'll see the beauty of being holy. Holiness, again, is not perfection. Holiness just means I'm set apart for God's use. We'll never be perfect, but we can get rid of imperfections. And I pray, Father God, that we'll stay on your side and truly champion your cause and stay committed. I pray, Father God, that we'll be more like you than this world. From your vantage point, when you look at us, I hope you see a difference. I thank you, Father God, for this message. Seal it in their hearts. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. For those watching on YouTube, on Facebook, I want to thank you guys so much for watching, those listening on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, etc. Do me a big favor. If this message was a blessing, please share. Do me a favor. Please comment below. Let me know what you got from it. And secondly, look at the links. There's links for you to uh, give, get involved, give me out to your city. And there's a course in there as well. Feel free to navigate through our resources and see how we can better serve you. I love you guys. Be blessed. See you next time.